I, I, I'm Alexis, I'm one half of Weird Effect. Um, <laughs> and I'm Lottie, and I've been emailing you confusedly because I'm very tired. She's very tired. <laughs> and I'm Courtney. Hello, so, Courtney. I have a couple questions for me, and then also one of my uh, colleagues is going to be doing the actual review of the game. So okay. he sent over a couple of questions. Okay, so. Great. Um, the first question that's actually from both of us is, where did the idea for a cultist simulator come from? Well, it's it's um, it's obviously based on a uh, documentary, you know, I mean, <laughs> I've had a lot of these issues, no. Uh, where did the idea come from? It's, um, I like games where you can do things you don't normally do in games. So a lot of my previous games featured like composing poetry um, or being invited to dinner. And also murdering monsters or being murdered by monsters and, and um, wandering around underground space and all the rest of it. But I like a lot of the stuff you can do in books you often can't do in games. Because games are focused on, on 3D uh, or, or 2D sort of high fidelity environments. So I started thinking about, about being characters from um, uh, fiction. And I started thinking there's lots and lots of games where you get the opportunity to play the hero in a horror story. But there aren't so many where you get to play the antagonist in a horror story, where you actually get to be um, uh, Kerwin from Charles Dexter Ward or, or Belloc from the Raiders of the Lost Ark film. Uh, and you are sending out agents and you're trying to achieve different goals. But you are an interesting, sympathetic, flawed antagonist. Um, the kind of character that a player might, might uh, cheer for over the hero in the film, who probably be played by Alan Rinkman or somebody. So that, that's what really... So you're saying that you basically amplified Tyler Ren. Yeah, oh, oh well, <laughs> Ren's a bit emo, but you know, that kind of thing. Maybe, you know. But, but, but yeah, uh, so that, that, that's the initial spark of the idea. So that was a thematic thing, uh, along with the fact that I'm a big old goth and I like doing big old goth stuff. And mechanically, I wanted to make a game that was narrative, but also about managing resources. And I wanted to experiment with moving away from all the choice-based narrative I've done in the past, where you're presented with basically a list of choices and which are unlocked or not and choose them, to having a game where you can make a choice at any point. So once you're past the first few minutes of Cultist Simulator, you can change your mind about stuff and try different things all the time. You can always take cards out of slots or put them back into slots. You can always start doing different things. So you you, you constantly are presented are present with the same choice that you can re-examine. You just make a choice and then wait for the game to give you another one. And that ties into the other things I want people to feel, which is constantly um, very worried. I want it to be a game that, that makes you feel lonely, anxious and yearning. But that's how I feel all the time. So that's been a fun game to market. Yeah. I mean, using Sunless Sea as a backing for the marketing, yeah. I think, is... People know what to expect. My my colleague didn't. Oh no, okay. He he had not played either Sunless Sea or Fallen London. And he, um, it, it was a very interesting response to Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we've been really frank about from the beginning and it's been, been tempting to turn us aside from this several times and stuck by it, is this is going to be the UK term, which doesn't translate, I think, well across the Atlantic, is a Marmite game. So Marmite is this kind of black junk, that, uh, black gunk that you buy in jars and crazy people put in their bread. It's delicious. But some people think it's delicious. <laughs> but it's famously divisive, and the, the marketing slogan for it is you either love it or you hate it. Yeah. Um, so we describe things that, that, you know, you feel strongly about one way or the other as Marmite, um, and we've always considered Culture Simulator to be a Marmite game. And that because, was it. Go on. Well, I was going to say, because we're only a two-person team, we, work, we do work with freelancers, but it really is only two of us. And I only joined about what, five months ago, so it was Alexis is essentially a solo effort for, for much of the development. Um, so we don't have the resource to make um, a game that will have everything for everyone. And I don't really think that's a possible mm -hmm. creative ambition anyway. So we decided very, very early on that what we wanted to do was make a game that was really good at certain things um, and lean into the stuff that Alexis is particularly interested in and that, you know, Fallen London and Sunless Sea had already played around with, uh, which obviously meant that some people would pick the game up and think, like, this isn't for me. Um, so we've tried to... to that, I think that's part of the reason that we wanted to give such a pared down kind of card interface, because when you look at it, any screenshot of Culture Simulator or you play it for 10 minutes, you get a really clear idea of, like, what the gameplay is and what kind of game it is. 
Um, and I hope that quite early on, you, you know whether or not you, you like Marmite, essentially. Um, <laughs> but sorry, you were saying something. Yeah, that, that, uh, I mean, you, you covered most of it, but um, I had clear creative goals in mind. And we wanted Weather Factory to be the kind of studio, even more than Fail Better was, I mean, it's why I left Fail Better, that makes small, tightly scoped, unusual indie experiments. And the thing about an experiment is you can't know how successful it's going to be until you've done it. That's that's otherwise it wouldn't be an experiment. So we wanted to make something distinctive and different, and um, and I think we succeeded with that. But we'll see from, from the review, which I'm now very frightened of. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, so speaking of different, actually, the just the overall aesthetic of the game and the really the artistic design of, you know, the cards and all the symbols and everything. Where did that come from? Like, what was the inspiration for that? Uh, so the. Um, uh, sorry, I was being a uh, phone. Um, the. Um, So the very, very first prototype of the game was was, was grey boxes and text and no art at all. And I, you know, I, I I'm a writer primarily. And I, like, I like words, but I realised very quickly that wasn't going to fly. Um, so I called on the help of two freelancers. One was Catherine Unger, who's a very talented artist, does lots of game art, um, and she formulated the. Uh, I, I said I wanted it to be like a board game because I thought. Um, I, I love cards, I love the things you can do with cards symbolically and I, I had the idea from the beginning if it was something minimal then it would uh, allow space people's imagination to play between the text, the tokens and the cards. So I, I asked Catherine to do a, some, some really sort of simple symbolic uh, looking tokens and cards and then I engaged a guy called Martin Naroka who's a very talented uh, UX developer um, to look at a, a, a way to fit the concepts I had together. And it was Martin who came up with the idea of having this sort of free form approach where you have different token, you have tokens and cards on the desktop menu the way you like, which lends the game a much more creative aspect than I think we would have otherwise. So it came from three things really. It came from my desire to make something that looked like a board game and, and told the player up front, we're gonna evoke things here. We want this to be an atmospheric game, but you're gonna to need to use your imagination and Catherine's art, and Martin's synthesis. Hmm. So it really was like a really collaborative effort. Yes, I think I think one of the big um, lessons, I've, I've said this elsewhere, from working on Sun the Sea was when a team is functioning well, it produces ideas that none of the individuals in it could have produced on their own. So even when you get a kind of, you know, auteur or, or headline star, uh, it, it's it's the context and all the people involved who, who manage to make things emerge. I like that. I think I'm going to use that quote. For, uh... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, and actually, you know, since you said about, you know, like kind of board games, card games, um, another question from my colleague was, why do you think that dark, challenging, and slightly torturous games are so appealing to many players? Because he just finished a um, marathon test of Dark Souls, the board game, which apparently uh, wow. put him through the ringer. Do you have thoughts on that? You look like you do. Do I think you have today? Um, I've certainly noticed um, a trend in AAA games, certainly, uh, to skew more towards what I mentioned earlier, um, the kind of everything for everyone. Um, I think when you get into AAA budgets and scope, you, you simply need to target as many people as possible because you've got to make that money back and the stakes are just so much higher, which tends to mean that you tend to skew less challenging because you want to make it fun for everyone, right? Um, so I suspect that some people feel that's not satisfying and they actually really want to get a sense of personal achievement for having learned and improved and eventually either figured out or beaten, in the case of Dark Souls, um, the game itself, rather than having a more kind of escapist relationship with it, um, which I think is fundamentally just a different approach to games. I don't think either one is better. Um, I think that's that's true. I think, you know, Far Cry 5, it was funny, a lot of people were comparing Cultist Simulation and Far Cry 5 because they both have this cult theme. 
but of course in almost every other respect. It's so terrifying when I first heard someone say, oh, it's a bit like Far Cry. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's not. Nothing. And, and <laughs> far, far Cry 5 is an astonishing piece of work that's cost, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars that tries to be everything to everyone. And so some people will love it, but a lot of people will just, you know, kind of like it and have a good two dozen hours with it. If you're an indie team, as Lottie says, you can't do that. You have to provide an experience where you you say to people, here's a bit of a, um, a, a challenge. Um, this is interesting, you need to get to know it. I also think- And I think, I was gonna say, I think the general context as well is players and game design have just got smarter over the last, certainly over the last 10 years. I mean, board games, we talk about this a lot, uh, that the, the board games are being designed now are just much, much better than the ones you see in, that you saw 20 years ago. There's a real renaissance. And I think the quality of the conversation, the way in which players are aware of game design and the way in which players understand what is happening in a game and how they're interacting with it, that's that's changed so much from, from 10 years ago that people often are burnt out on the, the more approachable stuff and they want to look for something a little spikier and more interesting. I mean, I was going to say as well, I mean, quality simulators are a quite difficult game to categorise. Um, we kind of sit somewhere in, in between like strategy, literary narrative, RPG thing. Um, and I think having a, a particularly challenging game, even if some people find it a bit too challenging, really helps you get into, into character and helps with the role play element of it. So for example, I'm a massive Skyrim fan. I love everything Bethesda ever do ever. Um, and I, I've played that game for just an unbelievable amount of hours. But every time I make a character, I kind of feel like I'm just kind of going through the, the paces. And the paces are beautifully made and, and, and I love it, so I don't really mind. But I couldn't say that I've ever really connected with a character or myself as a character in that Skyrim world, however amazing it is in other respects. Whereas I feel if you have finished Dark Souls, or if you feel that you've conquered Cultist Simulator, I suspect that you feel that your choices and your personality mm. has been very closely imprinted upon the game that you've just played, which means you have a much more personal relationship with it, which I hope means that the game and the experience you had means more than if you had a, a wonderful experience with another game where you didn't have that relationship with it. And I think you've talked, Alexis, about the game um, you wanting to have a dialogue with a player in Cultist yeah. Simulator. Yeah, I think I hadn't really thought of, 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 of it in, in, in those terms until you just said it just now, but I think you're you're right. If you, um, if a game challenges you, and if a game causes you some moments of pain, uh, then you can feel uh, you've expressed yourself more clearly through the choices that you've made to overcome it. And a lot of the time, a lot of what people want is self-expression. Yeah. And, and and yeah, Cult of Simulator is um, in the earlier builds. There was a lot more of the game sort of just sort of staring at you and defying you to do something you put tokens in slots it would just kind of shrug at you and say uh nope doesn't doesn't do anything and we've moved to a point now it's quite hard to try something in the game without getting some sort of clue back it may not be a useful enough clue for you to solve the puzzle right away um it, it may still be a bit tortuous but there's something ongoing you know you always get some sort of response and i think just as people want to express themselves, people also want to feel they're being paid attention to. I think that applies at the macro level with developers, and it applies at the micro level with game design, that people like games that listen to them. And if the game is out there saying, yeah, you're having a great time, here's some amazing effects, it's all, all great, you just say, no, don't worry, you just, just sit there while I'm playing the cutscene, then you don't have the sense of the game listening to you in the same way. Hmm. Now, Lottie, you used um, a rather interesting expression. You said that if you feel like you conquered the game, is there, I haven't gotten far enough into it, is there an actual end point? Yes, so there are multiple um, ways the game can end. Um, the most common one is that you die, um, but it is- I got there. Art, like, <laughs> well, there you go, so you want baby steps. Um, well, that does unlock an achievement. It does, and there are multiple ways to die, so that's fun. But but no, there are multiple um, win conditions. And do you want me to spoil you? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I won't go too far into it, but there are both occult victories and non-occult victories. Because again, one of the things we, we started out being interested by at the start of this project was the kind of balance between the occult and the mundane. 
and and you know the fact that that the character that you play in Cotter Simulator is somebody who's involved in the real world. You know, they have um, acquaintances, they have a job, they have um, human needs, but they're also very interested in this very like otherworldly. Uh, form of existence which has different um, requirements of them. So a lot of the game is balancing your worldly um, resource with your occult resource and trying to make sure that you can progress and learn more about the occult without totally forgetting the fact that you need to eat, for example. <laughs> um, so you can you can win the game right now by following um, several occult paths to their conclusion. Um, it is quite hard to do that. It takes a while, but we want you to commit and we want you to, mm. to figure stuff out as you go along. It shouldn't just be like, oh, I figured out the way now. There is one optimal way to play Culture Simulator. Um, but we also wanted to put in the option for some people to say, you know what, actually, I'm kind of role playing a character which feels like the occult has, has taken a lot from them and it's done a lot of damage. Maybe I just want to go back to my nice clerical job and, and see how that pans out. Um, and we have always built Culture Simulator with. Um, longevity in mind in terms of development and, and life after launch. So assuming that we don't totally flop on launch, and maybe we will, and we'll change our plans, but assuming that it goes well, um, we do intend to add um, additional content as DLC, which would also add additional ending uh, possibilities. I should add there, our, our strategy is um, uh, free updates and paid updates in concert. So we'll keep on releasing new free content for the game, and alongside that, we'll be adding DLC as well. Oh, but yeah, yeah, as Lottie said, we we uh, we want to provide a variety of endings. So I wouldn't go so far as to say you determine your own victory conditions, but there are endings that some people would say are victories, and some people say are failures. Okay, um, and also to circle back around to the point of you know dying is an ending. Um, I noticed that it, as someone who's played Sunless Sea, it kind of starts out in a similar way where you're, mm. the game wants you to die, basically. <laughs> it really was, does. <laughs> was that intentional? Like, you, or was it, you know, just something that happened and you went, oh, well, this is a bit like Sunless Sea. We, we, okay. It was absolutely intentional. It's been toned down from earlier builds, actually, which were much just sort of unfair, um, uh, frankly. And I think the, the, the so two reasons it's there, three reasons really. Um, reason one is that I'm a big old goth, as I said earlier, and life is pain. Reason two <laughs> is that I um, wanted that constant sense of tension. So I always wanted you to feel you are dabbling with unknown forces. Uh, you are, you know, struggling to stay alive, even if everything goes well. I didn't want it to be a game where you ever felt completely safe. So I wanted constantly that darkness that's at the edge of the table uh, to be present in, in your experience of the gameplay as well. And the third reason is that after you die, there are other options. So if you die of hunger, the game will always present you the chance to play as a bright young thing, a, a rich dilettante second time out. And that's a much easier beginning. But it's also a very different perspective on the um, on, on the game, and it's also um, immediately allows us to showcase one of the unusual things the game does, which is that your previous characters show up as story features in the next game. So if you play as a bright young thing, then your previous character's name will show up in the papers um, of, of the estate after your father dies. Um, if you play as a detective, uh, you could end up arresting one of the followers that you uh, recruited uh, in the previous game, who's now making trouble for your next character. So so, so yeah, the three reasons. One, one I'm a goth. Two, I wanted the tension there. And three, it, it, it says to people, um, dying is part of the process. Um, it's, you know, you can't get through a game just actually about game design without mentioning Dark Souls. And Dark Souls 2, the first time you die, you get an achievement saying, this is Dark Souls. Just to make the point, this is what happens. And I wanted to do something similar here. Yeah, I think that's a really key point. Um, I think our biggest challenge in terms of explaining the game to people is, is getting them in the right mindset. So you'll notice when you first play it that the first screen you see is this black screen that says, um, a lovely quote from Faustus, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and at the bottom it says, basically, this is a game of experimentation. Um, don't feel anxious that, we ha that the game doesn't tell you explicitly what to do next. 
we want you to, to kind of exist in this world and explore a bit and eventually you'll figure it out and like it is designed so you can figure it out but don't worry that there's not a big like tutorial that pops up and says now go over here um and i think making it, designing it so that it is easy to die at the start and so you have a chance to, to get acquainted with a, uh, with a little bit of the mechanics, a little bit of what you're meant to be doing, but you're not so invested in your character that it actually really hurts when you die that first time, I think is, is a very important balance. Because as Aiki says, you know, it, it tells you that the death is okay. You see this kind of nice ending text, which, which you know, tells you that you, you died, but it isn't like, wah, wah, you really suck. Um, and then immediately you're offered the kind of consolation prize of like, here are, here are these cool different ways you can play the game. So immediately the game opens up in a way that you wouldn't necessarily know it will if you're just looking at that first opening tabletop for, for an hour, two hours, four hours. Um, so I, yeah, I think it's quite an important way of getting people in the right mindset, honestly. I think uh, the other thing that wasn't consciously intended, but we lent into once it started happening, is we saw that our beta testers, people who played the game for the first time, some people would, would immediately bounce off it and, and, and die and would show up in the Discord or the forums or the Reddit and say, Whoa! I can't, I can't stay alive. I keep something dead. What do you do? And then people come in and, 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 and say, Ah, well, have you tried what you need to do is and be aware of that. So right at the beginning, uh, it, it does incline people to go looking for the community, which given it's such a deliberately lonely game, is I think really nice contrast. Was that intentional or...? Not at the beginning, no. No, I would love to claim it is, uh, but, it, but it wasn't. Once we saw it happening, we lent into it and we started pointing people towards the places they could get advice. Because again, if I had been smarter, I would have realised this in the beginning. This is one of the reasons Dark Souls became so popular. If Dark Souls had been released before the internet happened, then it would have been a disaster. Because yeah, everybody had true. played it and given up and returned it to the shop. But now the whole point about playing Dark Souls is, is that you you find out what's going on um, from the community, from the YouTube videos and the rest of it. And Cultist Simulator is not as hard as Dark Souls, and nothing like on the same scale, but it's got the same effect, I think, of provoking community. So what we're essentially saying is that a happy accidental uh, side effect of making a game about cults is we have sort of managed to make our own cults. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> and you claim that's accidental. <laughs> that's our story. Um, now, I gotta say, uh, why why cults like you know because you could have made a simulator for you know just about anything and i mean why cults because especially you know as far cry 5 you know sort of shows it isn't you know an unheard of topic in modern times like it there definitely is a little bit of like political background, at least here in the States. Yeah, so you put your finger on, I think, a, a point that would surprise me, but I hadn't thought of as I got into development. So, so why cults? The answer is because I wanted people to do the kind of things they um, didn't normally do in games. I wanted them to have the opportunity to play an antagonist. And if you look at the kind of stories, a lot of Lovecraft stuff, a lot of similar period stuff, a lot of sort of um, stories that are not cults or, or fantasy or horror element, uh, the villain usually has henchmen, the hero is often alone with or a or the companion. This is one of the ways that we, we lean into the antagonist thing, right? But, um, and I just called it um, Cultist Simulator rather than say Occultist Simulator, because Lovecraft is an obvious reference from the beginning. People think of love cultists and think of Lovecraft. But of course, in the UK, that we, we don't have cults in the same way that it doesn't in the landscape of the US. I mean, you know, they exist and, and every sort of jolly. Years. I mean, the perception in the UK is kind of like Masons and like some kind of campy cult hood, yeah. hood people you see on kind of B movie horror films. Yeah, we we do. I mean, we, we've had nothing like Heaven's Gate. We've had nothing like Winko. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but it is interesting. I think there's a bit of a moment in time because we've seen. I think three other games that lot. do address managing a cult from um, a from a point of view for uh, from a point of view that's more like the US approach. The so Shrouded Isle, um, as Lottie said, um, Church in the Darkness, um, which um, uh, what are they called? Celtic. Not Celtic. I just know Richard Rouse. Yeah, Richard Rouse's uh, studio are uh, making, which is about investigating a cult. Uh, there's something actually it's called Cultist Tycoon. 
and there's a very fine mobile game called Underhand. And there's the finally officially licensed Call of Cthulhu upcoming game. There is, but that's not one where you're actually running a cult. So, that's right. But uh, so I, I think for, for whatever reason, um, I wasn't influenced by any of these games. I, um, I, I don't think any of them even announced when I started making Cult Simulator. Uh, but but there is some sort of moment in time, time happening. And I guess it's not it's not too much of a stretch. I mean, again, there might be some, some differences across the pond. But but the idea that people are suddenly interested in the phenomenon of a group of uh, people engaging in groupthink, which results in actions upon the world which are incomprehensible to other people not in that group. That that makes a lot of sense based yeah. on our last yeah. couple of years of, of like politics. Certainly. Yeah, both the phenomenon of Trump and the phenomenon of Brexit. Exactly, you know, half like, of each country thinks the other half has lost its mind. And I think that, I mean, th to be clear, like this is not a kind of politically hard-hitting game at all. Like, Cult no. Simulator very much does not intend to engage with that. I think this is, again, a kind of byproduct of, of a, a current concern amongst a bunch of people or a current interest. Um, but I think it, it balances nicely with, you know, enabling you to do bad in a sort of fun way. Because everyone you meet, if you consider what goes on actually in the fiction of the game, is also a cultist. Or, the, you know, they're an investigator and then sometimes you have to murder them and you feel a bit bad about that. But also you feel kind of like, ha, 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 like you were really annoying to me. So, yeah. so it's kind of, it plays with that. There are very few innocents. I mean, there are, but they're off stage and nameless. Well, for example, when we tried quite hard um, to get as diverse a group of faces as we could get into the game. So you'll notice when you play that there's a lot of women, um, there's a lot of ethnicities, um, there's a lot of ages. Um, because we feel, you know, that there's very clearly like a skew in the games industry towards like white young men. Um, and certainly a lot of the work that Alexis has done previously has also been deliberately and consciously diverse. So, so we tried to do that here with the resources that we could. Um, and we actually had a discussion where I said, hey, you know, would it be nice to have like a like a child in it? Because we haven't got any children NPCs. And I'm not saying, you know, like a baby, but what if we had like an obviously young teenager and mm. you could have a kind of Wednesday Adams character and that would be really creepy. And we decided against it pretty quickly because what we really didn't want is is people to feel that there was some kind of innocence being taken here. The game lets you play around and do bad things without a kind of big karma icon popping up and saying like, you have like gained the rank of really horrible, you should feel ashamed. Because the game wants you to embrace this fun stuff. And if we were constantly making you actually feel really terrible about your choices, I think you'd feel discouraged from experimenting yeah. in a way that, that the game design would really like tangle itself on. Yeah, we keep going back to say we want people to feel tense, we want people to feel worried, we want people to feel nervous, but we don't want people to feel actually miserable. Well, and because the, the victory conditions, you know, if you do manage to, to found a cult and, and gather people around you and follow your, your way to the occult endings that we won't talk about so we don't ruin it for corny, um, you do get a victory and you do feel really proud because the game is difficult. But, but the, the victory is not like, hooray, you know, you're happy and everyone loves you and it's great and all those bullies at school, they're all mice. Like, the, the victory conditions are kind of nuanced because you're a very good writer. Um, so, so you do constantly get a sense of like, yes, you have been amazingly well and you've beaten the game and good for you. But like, was that a good thing that you did? So I don't think we need to lean into that anymore and make mm. the player feel like, okay, you did these bad things, but actually feel bad about it now. Um, it all comes back to trusting the player to be... Yeah smart enough to, to bring their own uh, feelings to the game. Definitely. And now, so in terms of influences on the game, I mean, obviously the big one that people are going to draw is Lovecraft. Um, but was there anything else? Like what, you know, sort of influenced the atmosphere? Yes. So uh, as you say, Lovecraft, I spent seven years making games that people described as Lovecraftian and I always resisted the label because I could see a lot of differences. But with Culture Simulator, I'm making a game about, you know, occult horror in the 1920s. I just thought, what the hell, lean in. So I have lent in and there's there's, there's no mythos here. You won't find Shoggoths, you won't find Cthulhu uh, and, and the flavour is different, but there is that Lovecraftian thing going on. One of the other big influences I had has been an influence on a lot of my work was a writer called Roger Zelazny, who wrote a lot of um, uh, sardonic, poetic, uh, but very entertaining thrillers about um, immortals and monstrosities in the real world. And I think anybody who's read Zelazny will see uh, some of that, that flavour come across. And um, uh, one of the long-term influences, again, 
um, has been uh, Mervyn Peake, uh, a British writer, um, around about the same time as Lovecraft, actually, but, but enormously less famous. He wrote Gorman Garston, who did a, um, had this particular line in chilling, grotesque, but sort of uh, often funny uh, literature. There's been a really, really beginning of the start. I know uh, you always say it, but you're going to have to say it. Uh, yeah, as a critic, <laughs> critic once said of Pete, he, his writing was a rich wine of fancy, chilled by the intellect at just the right temperature. And that's his thing. He's kind of way over the top, but he keeps on being smart enough that it it, it um, comes out quite disciplined. And that was, we, we often refer to um, the, the tone of Alexis's writing um, as nasty but funny, but nasty but funny. Um, and I think you need that in horror. You definitely mm. need that that kind of callback because you can't have, you know, if you watch a, a horror film, you can't have two hours of just unremitting gore and pain and misery because you know people get desensitised to that and it stops being meaningful. Whereas if you if you have, you know, the the moment where the cord strikes and and the the heroine looks around and it's a cat, you know, you get that kind of moment of, of freedom and release, and then you can dive back into the to the real terror. Um, so in Cult of Simulator, the writing does um, vary very elegantly I think um, back and forth between being like actually probably chilling and there are a couple of bits in there that I really turned around to, to Alexis when I first read it and was like man like that's really stuck with me or like that's really nasty and I think this probably is the, the nastiest that you've gone in your game. It, it, it's less funny than Cult of Simulator like are, sorry there's Cult of London there's jokes ever. in there but it's not it's not but, dark well I didn't, I didn't mean that I meant, I meant the specific moments of chilling horror mm. I think are more disturbing than you'd find in Sunless Sea because there are moments where, like, you know, things are implied to happen in locked rooms with no windows, and you know, like, and it's very frightening in lots of ways. And of course, you put it back, and the overall sense isn't like this is a horrible world. The overall sense is exactly as you said, a kind of balance between mm. whimsy and gothic, and, and, and lots of good things. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely something that we inherited from. Well, you inherited from Peak. Yeah. Like, nasty but funny thing. Yeah. Okay, and. It, uh, in a similar vein, um, you know, the kind of nasty but funny, the horror, you know, that feel um, is really enhanced by the actual gameplay. Was that intentional or was that just something that just kind of happened? My um, driving passion for the last uh, uh, seven, nine years has been trying to find a better way to mesh narrative and gameplay. So if, if if it came across that way, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I wanted. And I thought, you know, this, I was constantly aware of the specific decisions that people could have to make in, in the system, in design, in resource, but in order to produce emotional effects. So absolutely, um, it, it's intentional. Um, I mean, one way to put it is that text is a way of making you care about what happens in the game. If you just give people a, a red token and a blue token and say, don't run out of blue tokens, it doesn't feel <laughs> the same. If you say, here's your health token and your money token, if you run out of money, you'll run out of health. So straight away, right, the narrative's giving you a reason to care. So ultimately, story is a reason for people to care about game mechanics and game mechanics themselves you know are, are interesting um but but, but use the, the the story to give them a, a grounding a stake and i think um there are games which are brilliant where the gameplay and the story are completely divorced it's possible to do um but i think every one of those games would be improved by the gameplay and the story being brought together so yeah deliberate okay and why did you choose for like the four, you know, basic elements of the game? Like I understand health and funds. Why was it passion and reason? That's a really good question. The very first prototype, um, the, the three basic elements um, were health, uh, uh, funds and sanity, because sanity was a, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a Lovecraftian trope. But it's also quite boring. It's always something you you want more of, um, or you go mad. But also, you know, it, it, it's 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 not a thing you can make a choice about. It's a very diffuse sort of thing. And also, I found when I started on the design, 
that sometimes you wanted your sanity to be low because you wanted, um, or I wanted the player to be having visions or pursuing rational paths. So I split sanity into reason and passion so that people can focus on more intellectual pursuits or can focus on more intuitive, whimsical, sometimes less sane uh, pursuits. And a lot of the um, the dream world exploration, which I guess is one of the mid phases of the game, when you get behind the world into the Mansus so when the map opens, um, that uh, is driven largely by by your passion stat. So um, by splitting sanity into health and passion, into reason and passion, I kept that same sort of reference to um, to mental balance being important and to things running away with you. Uh, and I had the dread and fascination as, as a hazard, but I provided that sort of basic dichotomy between things you know and things you feel. I think there's two things I'd add to that as well. Is is, is one, um, it, it plays into something we mentioned earlier in this interview, the fact that we wanted to, to have a balance between the occult and the mundane. Mm -hmm. And obviously reason would probably be more associated with people's everyday existence and passion maybe with, with their kind of lack of fulfillment and, and that would be represented by the mansus, which is dangerous, but incredibly rewarding if you, if you manage to kind of progress through it. And the other thing that I think is probably a salient point is that Culture Simulator is the first game that Alexis made having just left Fail Better. Mm where he left because you primarily felt that you weren't doing the writing and the creative stuff mm -hmm. that you really wanted to and you were kind of required to do all the very important but maybe less fulfilling stuff of actually running a company and managing people. Mm -hmm. um, so that might not have been a conscious decision, but I'd be surprised if it wasn't in there somewhere. I think you played into it, yeah. <laughs> okay, and... Uh, oh, and another question from my colleague. Um, did the theme of the game come first, or was it, you know, the gameplay that you thought you wanted to make like a cardboard game, or was it a mixture? It was. It was. It was a little bit chicken and egg. Um, but the, the theme, um, the, the the two sort of coalesced alongside each other. Uh, I, I, you know, whatever game I made next was likely to be dark. Um, uh, whatever game I made next was likely to involve uh, people doing things they don't normally get to do in games. But also I was interested in, in experimenting with these different kinds of making choices in games. And for a long time I'd been um, uh, intrigued by the idea of making a game a little bit like Doodle God. So, you know, you can, have you played Doodle God? Uh, no, but I know generally what it is. Yeah, so, 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 you know, the, the gameplay there is much simpler because you're just combining like fire and water or, or people and, um, and electricity and seeing what comes out. You don't get resources, it's just the puzzle. Once you've combined things, nothing happens until you've unlocked it. But I kept thinking in terms of making interesting choices, what if you could ask a player, not do you want to choose between passion or reason or good or evil or, or, or red or blue, but here's red and blue and evil and blood and light and rainbows and kittens and passion now tell me which two you want to put together and of course cultist simulator isn't that free form but that was one of the mechanical inspirations and i've been playing a lot of clicker games as well uh, because they were sort of big around about 2016 and one of the very early sketches i did towards the prototype i mean the, the very first prototype was almost like a clicker game it had more more gameplay in it but I like these sort of interlocking cycles of, of, of achievement, um, and I like the fact that the game played itself while you were while you were looking at it. Um, so, so there were mechanical and, and thematic inspirations at the same time, and I kept sort of bouncing between the two until they meshed up. Okay, cool. Um, let me see. Uh... Now, um, earlier you did mention plans for uh, updates to the game and DLC. Uh, do you have any details for those? Or Well, we, we can tell you um, the type of DLC they'll be. Um, we're always planning to release um, kind of small content bundles. Uh, so you know that as you play the game, that the game tends to revolve around you role playing a specific type of character. So you play as the aspirant, you play as a physician, or you play as a detective or whatever. And this starts you off with a set of different starting resource and a little bit of different narratives. Um, 
and the way that we thought we would do DLC is by adding more of these legacies in and more of these characters. So, you know, we were considering adding, adding in um, the ability to play as one of the burlesque dancers that you meet at the Geysers Club, or um, a uh, fallen priest who has lost his faith, or um, a summoned ghoul um, from a previous game. So we're not confirming which specific roles we're going to be putting in the game yet, but we are definitely committed to putting some new roles in mm -hmm. and doing some DLC because um, the game was kickstarted and one of the uh, best perks that we gave at the Kickstarter was this idea of Perpetual Edition, which is a special version of the game where you get free DLC for life. So we are definitely going to release something, but we've not yet uh, confirmed specifically what that something will be, other than it will be role-based content. I should add the Perpetual, could you just say this? Sorry, Perpetual Edition's available for the first week of launch as well. Um, yes. Yeah. But we uh, will be doing a press blast about that one yeah. later. Yeah. So. But the, I think, the, you know, the, the Cultist Simulator was always um, meant to be a living game. Um, Ford in London, it's my first game. Uh, it's been nine years uh, and it's still going. And even though I've left Fail Better, they're still adding content to it every month. So I do believe in building things that last. And I mean, at this point, even if they stop Fall in London, it's, you could spend years playing through it still. It's oh, a big yeah. game. There were, when I left, there were over a million words in there now. I have no idea how many there are now. Oh my God. <laughs> There's a lot of typing. It, I can imagine. <laughs> it wasn't all me. It was a lot of it, most, most of it was other people by this point. But a lot of us did a lot of typing. And so actually for Kickstarter, why did you decide to fund the game through Kickstarter? Was it necessity or did you want to use it as a marketing tool or was there another reason? So we're, we're big fans of something called um, open production, which is essentially where you develop um, whilst talking to your community as, as much as possible. Um, and Kickstarter is, is a really useful um, way of doing open production. Uh, it, it's great for lots of things. Firstly, it gives you money, obviously, which is nice. Um, it wasn't a necessity for us, but it's 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 nice to have. And yeah, you can never have too much money when you make games. But the key thing for me is it's a kind of validation really early on. Um, you have to uh, get something together so the gamer has to actually function in some kind of way. You have to be able to d express it sensibly so you have to understand what the game is about and you have to get people excited about it. And if you launch a Kickstarter or any crowdfunding um, campaign and you find that people aren't enthused about it, you bloody well want to know then yeah. rather than two years down the line when you spent all your savings to make this game and you launch it and no one buys it. So, so it's always good to do a, a check for the Kickstarter, even though it feels like quite a high stakes check. But I'm assuming that you know you're pretty keen on the idea before you, you, you kind of set set a crowdfunding campaign up. Um, it's certainly something that Failbetter and Alexis have done for um, a lot of other projects. Mm. So I'd say that you're very good at them now and, and kind of know what you're doing. Um, and, and it's great to get that community right then from the start because we have been in essentially a kind of stealth version of early access for the last six months really. Um, the game has been being played by all of our backers because we gave them keys, um, which means that we have a constant pool of essentially beta testers who can tell us where the bugs are and what they like about the game and what they don't. Um, and on top of that, we've got, you know, a bustling Steam forum and a Discord um, and people who've written guides and people who really care and people who are going to evangelize for us. Um, and all of that's come not because we've been trying particularly hard to get people to talk about the game, but because we've just been letting people play it as it's been developed. Um, so it's been quite an organic thing. But the result is that we've got 5,000 really nice people yeah. we have a great relationship with. And I, I, this is the thing. I don't want to undersell the importance of the funding because we, we I put some of my own money into the project. We've taken funding from Humble as well. Um, and, you know, it, it's just uh, games are expensive to make. But the original goal was just to pay the freelance. So I wasn't, um, if we'd only made the basic uh, threshold, um, I'd have just, just um, paid my own living expenses for six months. Uh, but the big thing for me is is that when people actually stump up money for a project it's where the rubber meets the road you can ask the the public would you like to buy this game and people will go yeah cool but if they actually are prepared to back it with their own money you know they really care about it you can ask people will you beta test this game and they will say yeah sure but if you actually, if they've, they've paid you money to make the game, then they're that much more likely to play it and give you feedback and care about the final quality of it than if they just stumbled across a free download. And finally, I think, and I cannot say this often enough, Kickstarter backers keep developers honest. 
when you are disappearing down the design rabbit yeah. hole, it's easy to lose track of deadlines, it's easy to overpromise, and if you know that you have to face your backers um, every two weeks, every month, and talk to them, uh, then uh, it, it helps you keep your goals realistic and your estimates honest. And I think, uh, you know, done right, uh, that's a really good thing for transparency. Done wrong, of course, it's a disaster. But we haven't screwed up yet. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, that is the end of my questions, unless there's anything else that you guys would like to talk about. Do you have anything else? I think we covered a lot of ground there. Yeah, no, I think I'm good. Okay, well, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, it was delightful to talk to you.